Good morning. Good to be here again in Lincoln. I uh, asked Pastor Michael what time I should stop. And when he informed me I couldn't go till 6 o'clock tonight, I just went over and deleted about 50 pictures there. I won't show you the telescopes that we designed for Mars, for the uh, science, for NASA's Mars Science Lab. And I had a bunch of pictures for the kids, but we're limited in time, and so we need to get to the important stuff. And uh, so I'd like to have everybody be on the same page. And uh, I'm going to do just a little bit of review from last night. By the way, we had telescopes here last night. And uh, oh, my computer's locked up again. Once in a while it does that, it usually clears in a moment. Computer expert up to figure out why this toolbar. There, there we go. Okay, I think we're ready now. Uh, just a little bit of review from last night. It's good for us to see the size of our Earth. We can put a million in our, our sun. In fact, we have a telescope this afternoon after lunch. We'll be able to look at the sun. Um, we've been, special telescope, we look at the sun, try to look at it every day. Yesterday, it's very quiet. It's been kind of quiet. This week, Monday, it went nuts. We had an absolutely incredible eruption of the sun. But it allows us to look directly at the sun. We can see flames shooting off the sun. And sunspots, we had some nice sunspots yesterday, which look like little blackheads. And when you look at the sun through the telescope, the Earth looks like a blackhead on the sun. We could put one million inside there. But is the sun the biggest one? No, we've got some bigger ones. Psalm 8, verse 3 says, When I consider the heavens, the works of thy hands, what is man that thou art mindful of him? So when you get out of this program, you may feel very small, but remember the cross tells you how valuable you are to Christ. So is the sun the biggest? No, here we compared to other stars like uh, Cirrus, Pollux, and Arcturus. Our sun is really quite small. Uh, on this picture, we can't even show you Jupiter, Saturn, Earth is gone. We can't even put a pin on the screen and show you the size of the Earth. But that's not the biggest either. Um, Betelgeuse in Orion is like a billion miles in diameter. Uh, Antares is even bigger. Now the, our, our sun has disappeared compared to uh, these other large giant stars. Uh, in fact, and with Betelgeuse, if we put our sun in the center here, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the asteroid belt, Jupiter, would all be orbiting inside Betelgeuse. It is huge, and now they've discovered it's got rings around Betelgeuse. The rings that go out about four, uh, well, about four light years, or about 25 trillion miles. In your automobile, if you're going to drive across the rings of Betelgeuse, the thousand miles a day would take you about 60 million years across the rings in Betelgeuse. Was well, that the biggest one? No, that's not the biggest one. We have Canis Majoris. It's about almost 2 billion, 1.8 billion miles in diameter. Compared to our sun, there's Canis Majoris. Now, that's the biggest star we know about. We don't know about the stars we don't know about. Are you beginning to feel like a bug on the windshield of life? To think that Christ had, you know, come to this little, this little tiny earth that's orbiting this little tiny sun. He left the beauties of heaven, the glories of heaven, the holiness of heaven, the worship of the angels, and all those things, and he came down here and he didn't have a place to put a pillow to put his head on, did he? We all probably had pillows last night. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured suffering of the cross. For the joy. What was the joy? Your salvation and my salvation was the joy that was set before him. Okay, this is all a bit of review of those, but there weren't that many people here last night, so you'll get another dose of this. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, people think telescopes get these big pictures of the sky, and actually we're looking at the tiniest little speck in the sky. And, the, and it, like looking through a straw, and I often, if the audience is smaller, pass out a telescope to everybody. Is, is the mic not... Picking it up? It's on, but not. Okay, we got the expert right here. I told him to get some duct tape last night because the regular tape wouldn't stick to my face. Okay. So the Hubble telescope in 1995 96 era looked in the north to photograph as far as we could in space, looked through what would be the equivalent of this little straw, okay? And people think telescopes get big pictures of the sky. Actually, telescopes look at the tiniest little speck of the sky. 
like 125th of a degree where you'd see one star through here the Hubble saw 3,000 galaxies, 3,000 other universes in the north looking out of the galaxy up towards the Big Dipper. And uh, then they, um, John 1.1 1, 1 tells us who created this. In the beginning was the Word. Christ was the one that created all this, isn't it? He was in the beginning with him. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. But then they went up and put better cameras on the Hubble and computers and so forth. And this original photograph actually was, this was 10-day exposure for 10 days. Those of you in photography, you know, you get a time exposure to see the things that are really dim. Well, they opened the shuttle up on the Hubble for, Hubble for 10 days. For 10 days, they wanted the light to come in from the farthest, farthest, farthest galaxy. For 10 days, light accumulated on that chip. But in this next exposure, they actually improved the Hubble so much, they ran it 8.4 hours. Got 6,000 galaxies. Got three, three, twice as many galaxies in eight hours, they got in 10 days with the exposure. That is how much it was improved. And then we just now, and a year ago or so, put up a camera on the Hubble. Was a repair, a $125 million camera on the Hubble. The new camera, we're going to show you some pictures, 100 times better than anything before. It keeps getting better and better. So we're at 8.4 hours, 6,000 galaxies. And then they ran at 84 hours. And here's the picture they got in 84 hours. Now, on the screen, through this little straw, where you might see one star, the Hubble saw 25,000 galaxies. How big is God? How many pictures would you have to take if you're going to take a picture of the whole sky through this little straw? About 27 million pictures. Multiply that times 25,000 galaxies. Each galaxy with 100 billion stars, how big is God? So suppose we could zoom in on just one galaxy. Now, by the way, Job 26 is either the outskirts of his ways. He's <laughs> talking about the heavens. These are just the outskirts. You go to Chicago and you get to the outskirts of Chicago, you know. <laughs> it's a long ways across Chicago, isn't it? Okay, if we had just had one galaxy, if we could just zoom in on one galaxy, it'd look something like this. And if you lived on one side of the galaxy, you traveled across the galaxy, and you want to check on things they're doing at home, you get your cell phone out, and you call up Mama, you dial it up, and it's going to take you 200,000 years to get Mama's phone to ring. And these radio waves are traveling 186,000 miles every second. It's still going to take you 200,000. If Mama says hello, it's 400,000 years to hear the hello. Are you with me on that? You mean to tell me every little speck on this screen could take 100, 200,000 years to get a phone call across? Okay. For those of you who were last night, if you're doing the math, I realize I forgot to mention something. I said, this picture was taken, Cassini spacecraft. Cassini's going around Saturn, and when it's on the far side of Saturn, the sun is right behind Saturn. You see the glowing from the uh, backlit rings here of Saturn. You see how it, how it glows. This Cassini is like a school bus, 12 tons. We do not have a big enough rocket to get the Cassini off to Saturn a billion miles away. There's not a big enough rocket on Earth to get that thing, but they, but they could get it to Venus. So they shot it towards Venus. Now it's falling towards Venus. We got Venus right here, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and so the spacecraft is falling towards Venus, and it picks up speed as it goes around Venus. The gravity of Venus pulls faster and faster, but it misses Venus. It hits 77,000 miles an hour. Then they shoot it to Earth. It's falling towards Earth. Picks up more speed. Then they shoot it back to Venus. Then they go out to Jupiter, half a billion miles. And if you're doing the math last night, I didn't make that clear because it actually slows down again. Like if you're riding a bicycle down a hill, the bottom of the hill at 77,000 miles an hour, when you hit the top of the hill, you're going to slow down again. But it picked up speed with respect to the sun. Okay, like a guy with a discus. You see, he's, he's, what is he doing? He's rotating, but he's also running, isn't he? So there's two motions, the rotation and the body motion. So it did pick up speed, even though it didn't keep the 70, if it hit 77,000 and then picked up more and more and more, you're going like, this doesn't make sense. Um, and they saved 75 ton of rocket fuel by using gravity assist. Took 10 year, seven years to get to, to Saturn. And then they flew it. They hit this, amazing that they could hit this window, the F and the G ring. They flew the Cassini right there, reversed it around, fired the rockets for 96 hours. Now it's in, picked up in orbit about Saturn. Okay? Amazing to think they could hit that window at a billion miles, hit that 2,500-mile window. 
And the first time they land on a little dot up here. Whoops. Not used to this. See that little dot right there? That's Titan. Those of you who were here last night saw the rings of Saturn. You saw the moon Titan going around, the biggest moon around Saturn. They landed on that. Was it, they jettisoned a lander and it came down with parachutes and landed on that little dot. is that amazing? But think of the God who created the law. Think of God who created the brains that could figure this all out. There's something else very interesting here because you all got your picture taken when the Cassini took this. Here is Earth from one billion miles away. There's Earth right there from one billion miles away. What's interesting to me, we're going to get into the attributes of God here in a moment. <laughs> Ellen White was on a ship going to Australia. If you were on a ship and you looked out and all you could see for three weeks, every morning, every night, all you could see was ocean, would you think the earth was small? It seemed pretty big, wouldn't it? If you go three days, it would take you through, uh, three weeks. I mean, every day for three weeks, you're looking at ocean, ocean, ocean. You know what she says? Behold him who numbered the stars and created the worlds, which this earth is but a small speck. There it is. There's earth from a billion miles away, that small speck, and would scarcely be missed more than a tiny leaf in the forest. I was raised in Minnesota. And you walk through the forest in the, in the fall, and it's leaves, inches and inches of leaves. <laughs> this earth would scarcely be missed more than a tiny leaf in the forest. This is repeated. She says similar things about this earth being a little speck. How did she know? We did not know 130, 40 years ago that the earth was a little speck, did we? Okay, let's move along. Oh, by the way, where's the moon? <laughs> okay, beautiful. Well, it's not an exploding star in a Milky Way galaxy. It's an they think they don't know what's going on here. In fact, anybody says they tell you they know what's going on. But it seems like we had a blast of light that illuminated these beautiful clouds. But we want to talk about the, for 20 years I've been saying the heavens declare the glory of God, but you know I've discovered other attributes of God that are mentioned in the Bible. And I think I said 17. Actually, I think there's more than that. But I want to share some of those things with you now about the attributes of God. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. From everlasting, it would seem like that if you went to the farthest galaxy, 29 billion light years away, even in a jet or even in the Cassini uh, or the Voyager spacecraft, it would seem like from everlasting to everlasting to get out there beyond the numbers boggle the mind. I can't give you numbers of how far it would take us at our travel speed of our, even our fastest spacecraft to get out there to 29 billion light years away from everlasting. We're going to see the mercy of God, Psalm 103. We're going to see the mercy of God. Uh, we're going to see the power of God. I'm going to show you an eruption on the sun, 120,000 sextillion tons of matter blasting off the sun. Jesus said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Uh, we're going to see the riches of God. I'm going to show you a star that has 100 trillion trillion carat diamonds on it. If you Google diamond star, you'll discover that somebody said, how do they know? The temperature, the pressure, the carbon, everything is just right. They think this star, this one star I'm going to show you a picture of, that has a hundred billion, trillion, trillion carats. Diamonds. Carat, I should put a C in there. I told you I had dyslexia. Okay, let's go on. We're going to show you the extravagant beauty of God, the divine holiness of God. How holy is God? Moses was quite a holy man, wasn't he? He spoke face to face with God. And yet, what did God say? Moses, take those shoes off. <laughs> this is holy ground, Moses. Even a man like Moses. We're told that when Moses died, God missed him. Did you know that? Moral purity. James 1.17 says he's the God of lights. Isaiah 40, 25, our scripture for today, his creativity, one of the attributes of God is his creativity. And he has given each one of us some of that. Don't you love to be creative? As not everybody want, I don't care whether you're decorating your house, decorating a case, where you're making a motorcycle, whatever you're doing, we have one of those attributes of God, the desire to be creative. And we certainly see it in the heavens here. Uh, the heavens declare his faithfulness. We're going to show you that as we move along. The love of God, we're going to see the love of God of... The Bible says by his understanding, by his knowledge, by his wisdom. And it's all talking about creation of the heavens. It's all repeated in Isaiah 51. And his presence is the fullness of joy at his right hand. Our pleasures forevermore. 
His goodness and his justice. God is good and just. And that was one of the charges of Satan. How could he be forgiving and still be just? That's just, that's a bunny trail. We could just go right on down that one. But uh, we don't, we got five minutes to 12 past here. I got to really talk fast. <laughs> the Bible says he inhabits eternity, but he inhabits our praise. He inhabits your praise. We're going to talk about that, okay? Uh, he alone, God alone possesses these qualities or attributes in perfection and perfect balance. Therefore, only God is righteous, holy. Okay, here's the cone nebula. Um, I found a little verse. It says, love found a way to redeem my soul. Love found a way that could make me whole. Love sent my Lord to the cross of shame. Love found a way, oh, praise his holy name. We do have stars that explode. This star, nobody noticed the night before, and all of a sudden this thing was so bright it could be seen in the daytime. It's in constellation of Taurus called the Crab Nebula, and it blew up, and they, this happened on July 4th, 1054. They made the record of the Chinese who recorded this star that was so bright could be seen in the daytime. And, and this has been standing out, expanding outward since uh, 1054, and they photographed this one every 15 years, played it on, back on a computer. Uh, and the, the theory is, the, biggest, the belief is these biggest stars use up their fuel, burn up their hydrogen gas, and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And like a balloon, they pop and a, a very, very bright for a few weeks or a few months. And, uh, but this is just, I want to zoom in on this because of some of the beauty. This thing is expanding outward to 4 million miles an hour, which is pretty fast as that cloud goes. And as we zoom in, you see the beauties there of this crab nebula. Voltaire says that God made man in his image and man has, re man has returned the favor. God, just like us, tendency today is just, he's just a buddy, you know. God is holy and righteous. And his ways, he says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. His thoughts as high as the heavens are above the earth are my ways above your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth are my thoughts above your thoughts. How holy is God? Words, it's the unspeakable gift. Words cannot describe it. As high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how great God's mercy is. This is one of those exploding stars. This happens to be the closest. The ring nebula. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. This is, the, uh, this is the helix nebula, which is the closest to us. It takes light about 450 years to get here from the helix. And uh, we've got some beautiful, uh, beautiful pictures. We're going to zoom in that. Heavens declare the glory of God. That, by the way, is also our website. Uh, we have the Telescope website, but also the Heavens Declare website, Heavens Declare Incorporated. And um, when we look at the creation, I think we see the, the triune God involved. When you see all these beautiful pictures, you know what? The Bible says, by His Spirit hath He adorned the heavens. By His Spirit hath He garnished, the King James says, by His Spirit hath He garnished the heavens. John 1.1 1, 1 says, talks about Jesus, all things were made by Him. Genesis 1 talks about in the beginning God, all three, I believe. And also in Genesis, it talks about the Spirit of God. So we see the Spirit of God, we see Christ. I think we see all three involved in the creation. Um, by His Spirit hath He adorned the heavens, Job 26, 13, 1, 2. Zooming in on the uh, Helix Nebula, we see beautiful, beautiful colors here. These almost look like comets uh, because the uh, solar wind from the star. When these stars explode, there's always a remaining star in the center. And you see these little fingers here that are caused by the solar wind traveling outward from the center there. And Albert Einstein said, there, the deep emotional conviction of the presence of a superior reasoning power which is revealed in the incomprehensible universe forms my idea of God. That was Albert Einstein. We're looking at part of a veil nebula. And the Bible says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now we see another one of those exploding uh, stars that the gaseous clouds are heading it outward. The heavens declare his creativity. And uh, when we see the beauties, they certainly are. Who created all these? Isaiah 40, once again, our scripture for this morning. He, in Jeremiah 51, 15, he hath established the world by his wisdom. 
You think it takes wisdom to put the earth in orbit, to put in uh, you know, all the, the, the universe that we're seeing? He hath made the earth by his power. So there's some of the attributes of God, his power, his wisdom, his knowledge. The power in the atom is unbelievable, a trillion times more than a chemical reaction. Power in the penny, there is enough energy in the penny. If you could release the power in that atom to create 220 tank car uh, of gasoline. Um, we see the Crescent Nebula in Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. God did not lift a finger when he made the heavens. By the word, power. You see, this is mass, okay? And Albert Einstein said that every matter, for form of matter, is a form of energy because of the power in the atom. And the, he says the equivalence of mass and energy. God, the power, this incredible power from his mouth, from his word, could, could call any kind of mass into existence. And Albert Einstein would agree with that. By the word of the Lord of the heavens made, the power of God is so powerful, he could call the heavens into existence. Um, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. I'm going to show you an eruption on the sun. Okay, the heavens declare the power of God. I want to show you, here's an eruption on the sun. 120,000 sextillion tons are blasting off the sun. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. That's nothing. Wait till you see some other ones coming up. How do you like that one? Now the sun is this little disc, this little red white disc. That's the size of the sun, but under 900,000 miles. So you were looking at eruption and going out millions and millions of miles from the sun. This one had happened in, uh, uh, this is January um, 26, and that was headed towards Mars. It wasn't, if it was headed our way, it might not be good. Uh, but we've had some head. Now watch this comet. Here's a comet crashing into the sun. As an explosion. That's nothing. Look at this one. Here comes a big comet into the sun. This happened uh, this year. And this, this whole disk we're looking at would be about two million miles in diameter. Evolution cannot explain how the sun formed. We went into that last night. There's a repeated eruption. Here's another eruption. Now the sun is much smaller on this one. Uh, you see the little white disk has gotten much smaller. Incredible eruptions off the sun. And this usually happens around the sunspots, which you'll see this afternoon. If we're lucky, you might be able to see some, some eruptions. I've seen them go out a quarter of a million miles there is a big eruption on the sun, tremendous power on the sun. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Could you use some of that power in your life? You think if God's, Christ has got that kind of power, that he can help us confronted with the enemy? Do you call upon that power when you feel helpless, weak, and defeated? Here we see a gravitational lens because of the mass uh, of massive stars in the center actually bending, lensing like a lens. It's bending light from distant galaxies. And here's an illustration of what happens when we have galaxies in the core. Uh, a distant galaxy, distant galaxy over here, and we're looking at it, actually bends the light. And uh, I put that in there because there was a scripture here I want to share with you. Isaiah 51.14 actually has... Uh, the attributes of God, three of them. He made the earth by his power. He established the world by his wisdom. He has stretched out the heavens by his understanding. So we see several attributes of God. To him that by wisdom made the heavens for his mercy endures forever. Uh, it says he's the father of lights. The, we're looking at a million stars in the Omega star cluster. And the Hubble, this is the, the picture the Hubble got with the $125 million camera they put on. Here's the picture the Hubble got with this new camera. And look at the colors of the stars in there. This is just, the screen is just filled, whoops, just filled. I'm not familiar with this. Um, just filled with little red stars, little brown dwarf stars. Um, do we have time for that video, Pastor? It's 12 o'clock. 
We got it. the Hubble zoomed in. The Hubble zoomed in on this patch of the sky, the Omega star cluster, part of our Milky Way. It's not another galaxy. It's a million stars, and they plotted these stars for four years. And in four years, they could project the motion for 10,000 years. And I want to show you this video clip of these stars moving, and you don't see one crash, all in their appointed order. What an incredible God we got. Worship. Something happened to my computer last night, and everything changed. Yeah. There's a, two zooms here. This is a very fast zooming in on the, on the Omega star cluster. And then, but following, we're going to get a much better resolution uh, up here. And it's going to start with the original picture uh, that we got with the, from the Omega star cluster before the Hubble got the new camera on it. And uh, so that's going to be coming up here in just a moment. Okay, here is the picture of the Omega star cluster before we got the new $125 million camera on the Hubble. When we switch over, uh, and these are blazing suns. You saw the eruption on our sun. I mean, we got a million blazing suns. These are all suns. Our sun is just an average star. Pouring out, our sun pours out 4 million tons of mass every second. Every time you snap your finger, 4 million tons of mass. Now, here we go. As it zooms in, minute you're going to see the motions of these stars how they're going to move in the next 10,000 years probably planets around each one of those stars Just read in Jeremiah 51, by his wisdom. Do you think it takes wisdom to do that? By his knowledge. you think it takes knowledge to do it? By his understanding. He made the heavens. There's a zoom in on Orion coming up there, but... This is the farthest we've ever seen. This is the, this is, we're looking at a galaxy, we think probably about 29 billion light years away. When I see this, I think it's what it says in Psalm 103, verse 10. It says that he has not dealt with us after our sin. Are you thankful for that? He hasn't dealt with it. He has not rewarded us according to our iniquities for as high as the heavens are above the earth. How high is that? 29 billion light years. Can you comprehend 29 billion? For as high as the heavens above the earth, that's how great God's mercy is toward them that fear him. You cannot comprehend that. What's the next verse say? As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed your, trans your transgressions. Your transgressions. How far he's removed our transgressions from him. How far is that? Can you comprehend how far the east is from the west? Can't comprehend that. That's how far he's removed our transgressions from us. I need to tell you that Albert Einstein said that if you had a big enough telescope, um, you could see the back of your head. Because space is curved, and he thought a big enough telescope, you see. Whether you're looking through the microscope or the telescope, we have the most incredible God. Oh, I love to look at this little creature. That's called a Melicerta. It's a brick. She's a mason. She's making bricks. She's making her own little tunnel to live in. And I've seen her when she's disturbed. She'll, the head will go down when a rotifer comes by, and then she'll, head will come out again. 
and she has cilia that spins around circling water. She's making a brick. You see a brick right there being made. Right? Right there is a brick that's being made and it sticks here. I'll tell you that it is so incredible. I watch the little leech type rotifers that look like Huey helicopters. They're so small they can swim through the strand of your hair. And they have cilia that looks like Huey helicopters. When they're disturbed, they, they, they retract them and then they open them up again and start spinning and circling water feeding on that. What incredible, whether you're looking at a microscope or telescope, it is the most incredible God that we worship. Look at the compound eyes that we see on a house fly. Oh, the depths and riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. Compound eyes. How does evolution explain this getting from amoeba to a compound eye with 30,000 lenses, 30,000 optic nerves? And those house flies are good. Can you catch them? I miss them even with a fly swatter. Can you catch them with their hand? I mean, they can see all around. 30, some of these have 30,000 lenses. What an incredible God we worship. Even trilobites have compound eyes. What a creator. What a creator. And, uh, oh, by the way, in the newspaper, the Kepler spacecraft keeps finding about 2,000 planets. And you'll see it. This is the newspaper clipping. We discovered a planet. Wow. And it could be like Earth. And it, <laughs> you want me to see what they uh, show you? I want to show you what they actually discovered. Okay? This is what's in the newspaper. Here's what they actually discovered. There is the star... Right there in that little box, that's what, they, that's what they saw. Here's what's in the newspaper. Here's what they saw. Okay, you see how big the sun is? You see, the, the thing of it is, the blazing sun, can you, can you look at it today? You see, it has this incredible amount of heat and light, and the planet has nothing. It's dark. It, it only can reflect light. It's little, little, little. These planets are so little, they don't have any light. And that's why it's so difficult to find them. And we don't have time to go into how they do find them. There's a number of ways. We've had some beautiful northern lights, the aurora borealis from the uh, solar particles we've had in the last couple of weeks, charged particles ionizing the hydrogen atoms. This is HD 97048. This star, astronomers, Lawrence Livermore University tells us this has a thousand to a million trillion tons of diamonds on AC 97048, and here's the other one. I told you to Google the diamond star, BPM 37093. It has 100 billion, trillion, trillion carats. The diamond star. You think there's any problem for the Lord? Streets of gold, gates of pearl? No problem. The heavens declare the love of God. Jesus considered a place to heaven not to be desired while you and I were lost. Heaven was not a place he wanted. Looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The heavens declare his faithfulness every morning. That sun keeps coming up, right? His faithfulness repeated in the Bible. Again, again the attributes of God we see in the heavens. Mercy shall be built up forever. Faithfulness shall thou establish the very heavens. Thy faithfulness. So we see the sun coming up and we see it going down every day, don't we? I'm going to move along because just in the interest of time, there's a lot of scripture can go along with this. A beautiful picture of a ring nebula, a very galaxy here, and uh, another lensing. Light is bent from a distant galaxy into a circle. So this right here would be a massive galaxy and it. Distant, distant galaxy being bent by a, just like a lens. And uh, supernova uh, are these exploding stars. And I think we'll just move right along here to show you uh, some of the latest pictures of a galaxy gravitationally bound together. You see how this arm is stretched out here. Um, we have no end, 100 billion galaxies out there. There's the... This is the cone nebula I showed you last night. You see that little cone? Oops, I'm looking for the laser here. See that little cone right there? Here's a close-up of the cone nebula. I told our audience last night that I think it should be a monument here for the state of Nebraska because we had so many cones yesterday coming from Denver. God's extravagant beauty. Would you like to see, can you imagine? Moses said, can I see your face? 
Psalm 17 says, As for me, when I behold thy face in righteousness, I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Imagine what the face of God will be like to see. We can see God through the things he has created, through the beauty of the heavens. Um, I got to move along because I got to get down to the closing here, folks. Normally in the evening programs, we have an hour and a half, but in worship service, it's already 12.15, I can't believe it. Okay, well, we got to do this, okay. In Psalm 96, it says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Do you see the ugliness of this planet? Are you sick and tired of what's going on in this planet? Are you sick and tired of seeing people blow their bodies up? You know, who's causing all this hell on earth? It's Satan, isn't it? We need to be clear. We need to put the blame. People say, where's God? 9-11, where's God? Starving children, where's God? And the Adventist understanding of the great controversy explains that, doesn't it? Because Satan causing all the hell he can cause on this planet, could God gets blamed. If God solved every problem, healed every cancer, the angels, and we would never be able to evaluate who is right, Satan. So we see in Psalms, it says, Praise you the Lord in the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, ye heaven of heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for the name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. C.S. Lewis was reading Psalms and he, in the very beginning and he had real difficulty. Why does God need his praise? Why does he need his praise? And then C.S. Lewis said, you know that actually our enjoyment, all enjoyment spontaneously overflows in praise. I came into the shop one morning, I didn't even, I don't think a shop foreman even said good morning to me. I walk in the door, and it's early, I mean, it's, you know, 6.30 in the morning, and Dave says, did you see the game last night? Oh, I didn't watch the game last night. And I realized poor Dave is going to have to suffer for two hours till Tom Johnson gets in because these guys know the teams, know the scores, know the wages, know their averages, and they can have the joy of sharing the game last night, Right? You see how, when things are important to you, how you've you got to share it? Are you praising the Lord? How much joy are you taking in the Lord? Montana, he says, our joy is consummated in praise. If something really exciting happens to you and you can't tell your wife, you're going to blow up, right? I, man, where is she? I can try to call her on the phone. Guess what happened today? You've got to share it with your loved ones, don't you? So C.S. Lewis says, your joy is consummated in praise. Thirty-five, thirty-six times it says, rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to skip over this because we've got to get down to, we've got to find, close this off here, folks. Got some repetition there. Okay. Um, Psalm 103, verse 10. Okay, we've done that one already. Okay. Not dealt with us after our sin, no reward us. He remembers that we're dust. Are you thankful for that? His mercy endures forever. Mercy endures. Mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. Astronomical. Despise thou the riches and goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. It would be the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. I've got to share this with you. Do you ever think about what the cows get to eat and the horses and the rabbits and the robins? What kind of food do they get? You'd be, if evolution was true, you would be lucky to have lettuce, and maybe some oatmeal. If you really, everything on planet ever came from an amoeba, you would be lucky to have lettuce and oatmeal. What do the cows eat? Grass, right? Maybe grain once in a while. What do the birds get? The robins get worms, right? Do you realize that, that God has given on this planet, in all the cultures, 20,000 herbs and spices? If you look worldwide, God has given us 20,000 herbs and spices. What would you do without cinnamon and oregano and garlic and onions and, oh, 
Isn't that something the goodness of God has given us? All the different foods. The animals don't get that. That's just the goodness of God, isn't it? Don't you love a God like that? I'm going to skip over this one too, folks. I'm sorry. Just, I'm just slipping away too fast. Okay, but we'll go back to one more picture here. Okay, you've heard it said that you have 15 minutes of fame. If you get to be on TV in your life for 15 minutes, your life is fulfilled. On this little planet, on this little ball of mud, your life is fulfilled if you get 15 minutes of television time, right? You know, you can have fame that spread throughout the universe because you know what it tells us? In Luke 15, likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Your repentance spreads throughout the universe. You think 15 minutes of fame on this little ball of mud would be something? Your repentance spreads throughout the universe. <clears throat> Don't you love a God like that? If you love me, keep my commandments, okay? Okay. Um, Hebrews 12, verse 14, there is a holiness without which no one will see God. If you think we're going to be sinning until Jesus comes, I think we need to define our terminology. We, I believe, are not going to be willfully, knowingly, planning to sin, cherishing sin, making provisions from the flesh. We're human. Until Jesus comes, we're human. And some say, well, it explains my problems. But you see, there is a holiness with which we must have. And if... We are planning to sin, preparing to sin, loving sin, cherishing sin. Not going to make it. We are pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. <clears throat> we're closing now. One more picture. That prodigal, that prodigal son went out and spent and wasted his money. Came to himself and realized, my dad's servants are much better than I am. Much better condition. Now, I'll go back to my father. I want not worthy to be a, called a son, but I'm going to ask him to be a servant. And you know, that father's looking down that road every day. I don't care what he's doing, where he's working, what he's keeping an eye on that road. Is that boy coming home? Is my boy ever coming home? You know how we know he's watching that road every day? Because the, we're told that he meets the son a long way off. He's watching. We're coming home. And one day he sees him a long ways off. That father goes down the road to meet him a long way off. We're told that if you take one step toward the Savior in repentance, he will meet you a long ways off. He will enfold you in his arms of infinite love. Never a prayer is offered, we're told. Never a prayer is offered, however feeble. Never a tear is shed, however secret. Never a longing after God, but the Spirit of God goes to meet it. I left out one word. You know what it says? Take even one step toward the Savior in repentance. Is that an important word? Even one step. God is going to meet it a long ways off. So does... His father waits till he gets up and knocks on the door? No, he meets him a long ways off. And he has a party. He throws a party. God will rejoice over you with gladness. In Zephaniah 3, he's going to rejoice over you. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing as in the day of a festival. Is that exciting news? Is that good news? What a God we serve. Let's read it from... Christophic lessons, where it says, Arise, go to your father, he will meet you a great way off. If you take even one step toward him in repentance, he will hasten to enfold you in his arms of infinite love. His ear is open to the cry of the contrite soul. The very first reaching out of the heart after God is known to him. Never a prayer is offered, however faltering. Never a tear is shed, however secret. Never a sincere desire after God is cherished, however feeble. But the Spirit of God goes forth to meet it, even before the prayer is uttered or the yearning of the heart is made known. Grace from Christ goes forth to meet the grace that is working on the soul. Wouldn't you like to kneel with me as we have a closing prayer and then we'll have our song. <clears throat> Our 
Our Father in heaven, we want to bow before you on our knee this morning, Lord, because you are the creator. You're the one who's, who made us. You're the one who made salvation possible for us. And Father, we worship you on our knees because of a great and mighty God that you are. My prayer that the things of this earth can grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace, and that each one of us, Lord, may have, if we have not, may make that decision to follow you, to serve you, rejoice with you in heaven. In Jesus' name we